Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is, I'm Peter Whittle. Now, my guest this week has just been awarded Contrarian of the Year Award 2019. Catherine Burblesing is a teacher, but she's also the founder and headmistress of the Michaela Free Community School in London, which she founded in 2014. But that's not really the whole picture because she has pretty much single-handedly fought against educational orthodoxies and indeed the educational establishment as it's been over the past decades. I'm thrilled that she's with me now, Catherine, welcome. Thank um, you for having me. First of all, I have to ask you, what's it like being contrarian of the year? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you know, when I was first told that I was being shortlisted, I thought it was all a bit funny. Um, it's great. I mean, uh, as I was telling the audience the other night, that um, I think contrarians tell the truth. Mm. And um, I, I, being a truth teller uh, is something that's quite difficult, I find. Uh, people are far more likely to take the easier road and just they don't like difficult conversations they don't want to say things that they think uh, especially in this day and age and so i was really honored um in that sense uh to be shortlisted and then to to actually win the prize um yeah i quite like being a contrarian <laughs> you're up against some pretty uh, awesome uh, uh yeah rivals. so there was douglas murray and there was david goodhart and there was a woman called helen pluckrose people may not know as, as well um who would uh expose the academic establishment by getting uh, essays published. Yeah, so yeah. she created these ridiculous essays, which were just absurd, and got them um, published in an academic journal, uh, which really was quite humiliating for the journal because... I know, I remember this was the one, wasn't it, where th they came up with these amazing sort of subjects like uh, studying dogs in school playgrounds and things like this to yeah. make various sociological points. It was all a spoof, wasn't yes, it? exactly. And so she made fools out of them, really. And, uh, and then, of course, David Goodhart is fighting for the summer Yes. against the anywheres and and then as I, you know Douglas Murray is trying to save the West um, yeah. and so uh, and then there was Theresa May actually who was also one of the contenders bizarrely because I sort of think she's not much of a contrarian no, no. Um, she's very conformist I would say but I don't know <laughs> anyway she was one of them and um, and yeah so it was it was great to win I mean uh, uh, you know I I think in anything, you know, in running my school, uh, I think all leaders need to be as kind of truthful as possible yeah. uh, with their staff, um, with themselves. I think often we are too dishonest with ourselves to um, uh, to, to really make a difference. Mm. Um, and I was just speaking to some new staff of mine this morning who are coming to join the school in September. And uh, they were talking about how um, in their schools, uh, one of them was saying that, you, you know, you get feedback. Mm. Uh, you, you, people go and observe a lesson and you get feedback. Mm. But at her school, they've decided to call it feed forward. Um, no. Because, and there was no reason. No, they've just no, decided no. it because it's more forward thinking and it sounds nicer. And then they spend two hours telling all the staff about this and they're wasting everyone's time. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's like they live in a different stratosphere in that um, uh, there are some people who are just uh, going through the motions yeah. instead of it being really real. Um, and I think people find me a little bit, you know, well, I always say I'm like Marmite and the school is like Marmite. Either you love us or you hate us. And um, same with me. Um, and, right. and it's because of the, the, the truth thing. I really like the truth. <laughs> um, and, 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 and I think, sadly, uh, too many people are quite happy uh, to ignore the truth because it's too difficult to deal with. Well, it's interesting because I just uh, recently we interviewed Roger Scruton. Mm -hmm. He was talking about the truth a lot in that uh, we're living in mm -hmm. this time of post-truth and all the rest of it. Yeah, um, yeah I think. exactly. You came and spoke to the New Culture Forum, you didn't, might not remember, but it was a good 10 years ago nearly, I think. Right. And that was before you set up the school. Um, how difficult was it setting up your school, Richard? You did it in 2014, so that was... You were already a voice, you know, in, in, on the scene. You'd written a book, which I'm going to hold up now, actually, which you can still get. Here we go. <laughs> to Miss With Love, I think, taken out of To, to Sew With Love, um, yes. the film. Mm. And um, this was based on a blog you did, wasn't it? That's right. So the blog was called To Miss With Love, um, and I was called Miss Snuffleupagus. 
because um, I on Snefini, uh, Sesame Street, uh, for those of us who grew up in the 70s, you know, you'll all know Sesame Street. Uh, there was Big Bird and there was Snuffleupagus, who was the big elephant, uh, this mammoth. And um, nobody could see Snuffleupagus, even though he was absolutely huge. So Big Bird would talk to the other people on Sesame Street and say, oh, my friend Snuffleupagus. And when people would arrive, Snuffleupagus wouldn't be there because <laughs> the elephant in the room, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so that's why I called myself Miss Snuffleupagus, which eventually turned to Miss Snuffy. So now I have the embarrassment of when I give my business cards to people as the headmistress of Michaela, it says Miss Snuffy on there from my Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it looks a bit odd, but yeah. that's why. And um, and yeah, and so I had this blog to miss with love, and I used to write a few p posts a week. I didn't sort of realize that there were kind of big politicians and so on reading my blog, uh, like Michael Goh, for instance. Yeah. I, I didn't have any idea. I was just a teacher doing my thing. Um, and then there was this woman from Penguin who was reading it as well, and she wanted to uh, make it into a book. So the book is essentially what the blog was. Right. I see. Um, and I was trying to explain anonymously what was going on in the school system because I thought it was broken. Um, and uh, when I then eventually said that out loud in 2010 at the Conservative Party conference, a lot of people didn't like me for it. Yeah, um, uh, this is what I mean about the truth, because I, I think everybody knows what's going on. <laughs> oh, you said quite recently that the, the parents, parents really, some parents, really have very little idea of how bad things are in state schools. Okay, I didn't mean parents. I mean everybody in teaching knows yeah. what's going on. So right. teachers have a sense of it. Yeah, yeah. It's just that I think too many people are in denial. Yeah. Um, I, absolutely, parents don't necessarily realize. Yeah, yeah. And the reason they don't realize is because schools are not really open to parents. So um, in Brent alone, where I am, uh, there are 15 secondary schools. There, only seven of them offer an open uh, day to parents to go and see what the school is like if you're yeah. in year six and you want to choose your school for year seven. Uh, so th that's fewer than half. But then even then, uh, schools will open up for um, a morning, mm. if you're lucky, in October to go and see it. What if you want to see it in May? What if you want to see it in June? And then not only that, but what if you want to see it at break time? Or at lunchtime, yeah, because yeah. they will take you down certain corridors and they will show you certain classrooms, yeah. but they won't show you the whole school. Uh, we at Michaela, however, are open all the time to visitors, and we have visitors that come every single day from around the world. And um, I feel that every school should be open to visitors at all times. Yeah. Uh, I think sunlight is the best disinfectant. And I think that if we could all see what was going on in the schools whenever we wanted, then there would be a better sense of what's actually happening in education. I don't. I mean, this is an interesting point actually because uh, I don't know if you, you, you've you've heard, but there's a report that I've just read. It was out today actually, um, which was basically saying that there was a school in Birmingham which seemed to have had at one point or another an outstanding uh, grade from Ofsted. But now the teachers are on strike because of the level of violence. Yes. I mean, you, you know you know about this one. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it got it outstanding in, in 2012. Right. So it has been a few years. And yeah. I know Amanda Spielman has been uh, complaining about this idea that if a school has been given outstanding, then it should just be left alone. Right. Um, because schools can change rapidly. Yeah. And when they were given their outstanding, they only had primary children there. Right. And then they grew, and now they have a secondary school. And the secondary school... Often you find uh, people who uh, deal with primaries, yeah. uh, they then think, oh, you know, we're going to set up a secondary school, won't that be great? Yeah. And they don't realize that it really is a completely different kettle of fish. It's yeah. much more difficult to run yeah. uh, a successful secondary school than it is a primary school. And that yeah. is not to do, you know, not to say that primary schools don't, aren't, aren't hard, but it's just a different thing. You have one uh, class with each teacher. You don't have children moving around the school, going from class to class. And also secondary schools are just much, much larger institutions. Yeah. Um, how, how large is yours at the moment? I mean, you know, how many kids do you have? So we have 600. Next year we'll have 700 and a bit. Uh, and then eventually we'll have 840. We've been right. growing every year since 2014. Yeah, yeah. And so at full capacity in two years, we'll have 840. Our sixth form opens in September, which is really exciting. Yeah. And we get our first GCSE results in August. Uh, so we're really at the beginning. But um, yeah, I mean, so the, the Ofsted point is that, uh, you know, things... Ofsted visits a school for a day and a half. Mm. I think people put far too much, um, they, they value Ofsted far too much, both the public and the teachers for that matter. Ofsted visits for a day and a half, uh, they make a snapshot, they get a snapshot, that's all they can do, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and I mean, look, we've got outstanding and I suppose I should be shouting it from the rooftops and saying, look, we've got outstanding, but you know what, that's not the thing that I'm proud of, you know? Yeah, yeah. The thing I'm proud of are the kids inside it and the teachers inside it. And if you want to see our school, come and see it. 
because yeah. we're open at all times. Yeah, yeah. And we're open at all times because I take great pride in the fact that I know with 100% certainty, if you walk around the school at any time, you will find all of the children learning, you will find excellent lessons throughout the school. Um, I don't have to take you down corridor B and avoid corridor A yeah. because I'm worried about what you're going to see there. Right. Um, I, I, and I think that's really crucial. Uh, I think also the public accept far too much you know, bullying and, and, and all sorts of things that go on. And so people say, well, it's just normal. It's normal for kids to behave yeah, like that. Yeah, it's not yeah, normal. Yeah, we yeah. can make a difference. We can change things. Yeah. We can have higher standards for children. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we do at Michaela. Yeah. And because we've got high standards for those children, they, they rise to it. Yeah. I always say, if you keep your standards here, the children will meet you there. If you keep them there, the children yeah. will meet you there. It's just a question of how high you want them. I mean, in a nutshell, really, your approach is 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 remarkably simple isn't it as i understand it it's basically teaching kids knowledge as opposed to learning skills whatever it might be knowledge and also discipline i mean basically those are the two isn't that right the two columns of your approach yeah that is right so when you say teaching knowledge what we mean is we value you know I suppose uh, a kind of political way of thinking about this is that it's more conservative to think uh, about uh, giving knowledge to the future generations. Yeah. Roger Scruton would think very much that that is the point of education, that it's our duty as educators to pass on knowledge from our generation to the following generations yeah. so that the country can do well. That's yeah. how Scruton would view it. And then there's the more left approach, which is uh, education is about creating revolutionaries and um, getting them to overthrow th typical thinking mm. and, and to getting, getting them to question. Mm. And um, and I'm all for questioning and being critical in your thinking. Uh, my argument would be, you can't do that without the knowledge, right? Mm. So then there are a bunch of people in the middle who will say that, who will say, well, wait a minute, we want our children to be critical thinkers, so we need to give them lots of knowledge. And I suppose that's kind of where we're at. Yeah, yeah. Um, although obviously my teachers, they, they think a variety of different things, but um, certainly that's where I'm at. Um, you, cert you cannot get children to be critical and, and, to have, uh, and to be creative and to think outside the box and to think independently if they don't know very much. And at secondary school, it is our duty to give them that. When they go on to the sixth form, when they go on to university, then they can use that knowledge to create. Um, but a 12-year-old can't create that much. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. And if they do create something, we are patronizing them when we say, isn't this the most extraordinary thing ever? Because actually it's not, because they don't know very much to be able to do much with it. Um, and sadly, over the last 50 or 60 years, we've sort of lost that in education. Uh, a, a teacher is more a facilitator of learning, moving around the desks that are grouped together while the children are leading the learning, as opposed to the teacher leading the learning. Yeah, I always say yeah. the teacher should be driving the bus, the children get on the bus, and it is for the teacher to keep the children on the bus, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And if one gets bored, oh, he's jumped off, it's for the teacher to make sure he gets back on. Um, and that we do throughout the school. And so uh, when visitors come, they're always so impressed by the amount our children know and just how clever they are yeah. at thinking yeah. and at being creative yeah. because they've got the knowledge to do that with. Um, and then the discipline. I mean, there's lots of schools who also have, you know, uh, high standards of discipline. Um, sadly, there are many people out there campaigning to have poor discipline. And I know people think, wow, that's ridiculous, Catherine. Yeah. How could they be doing that? Yeah. They don't go around saying what we want is poor discipline. What they say is we don't want... Um, uh, punishments. We yeah. think it's mean to punish children, yeah. so we shouldn't do that. What you need is to have a restorative justice conversation with them where you talk about what's gone wrong. Mm. Now, of course you want to have a conversation with the child because you want him to understand what he's done wrong. But if there's no punishment that goes along with it, I can tell you they are going to ignore the conversation. <laughs> because yeah, I mean, I think kids. I, mean, I remember we were ex we were exactly the same when, when I was at school. You knew when a teacher was trying to be down with you and everything, and you would kind of exploit it in a way. Exactly. I think the, the point that you're making is very interesting. Is the idea, for example, that it almost amounts to sort of maybe that knowledge is somehow going to imprison these kids, but in fact. Knowledge sets you free, doesn't it? I mean, this is the point. If, if you well, want to be free in thinking and you have to have structure and you have to have knowledge. Well, I can tell you the thinking behind it, which is that, uh, remember, they, wanted to, they want to reject the establishment, right? That, that's, that, this that's is the, the thing. This that's is what that's, you're that's, saying. The, yeah, yeah, that, that's yeah. the, the gut feeling there. And so dead white men, uh, it makes them go, ooh, I don't like that yeah. because they don't like the power that comes with it. Yeah. The power structure is such that the, these white men are on top and they don't want that. So 
uh, they don't want to teach all that stuff. It's about the content that they really don't like yeah. ultimately, yeah. and they want to reject that. So if you're teaching skills, then you don't have to decide which knowledge is more important. Because the problem with teaching knowledge is you've got to decide which bits of knowledge you're going to teach, right? And um, and then it becomes very political. You know, should you read Shakespeare or should you read Benjamin Zephaniah? And then people say things like. Well, you just read both, but we all know there's only so much time in the in the school day. The curriculum has to choose, right? And so then you come to the point of well, what is the point of school? And、um, again, the divide between right and left. I would say the right would see it more as、uh, schools are there to help socialize children, to help make them feel like they're part of a country, that they are British, that they have they learn their British history, that they read their British literature, yeah, yeah. that they that they are part of a certain a certain something. Uh, the left would see it more as no, we want to reject all those things. We yeah, don't want them to see themselves yeah, as British.、Yeah. Actually, being British is something we might feel a little bit ashamed about because look at the terrible things in, that、mm. have happened in British history. You know, slavery and so on. This is these are all awful. We might not think about the fact that Britain was a, a, a leading light in abolishing slavery, but we want to、that、ignore point, that.、Yeah. You know, and.、Um, <laughs> And 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 so and because of the guilt, I think that sits on people's shoulders for being British, they don't really want to teach that. And so then it comes to this idea: well, actually, what we want to do is teach skills. Now, that's my own philosophy on that about why we've come to this point.、Yeah. I, a lot of people wouldn't necessarily think that consciously. You know, yeah, yeah. now teachers are teaching, and they just they, they are told that the way in which、um, children come to really understand something is by directing their own learning.、Um, But how is a twelve-year-old meant to direct their own learning? I mean,、mm. take it down to a five-year-old. How is a five-year-old meant to know the difference between a triangle and a square unless you just tell him, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. He can't figure yeah, it out. It's、yeah. impossible. Now, this ultimately started with Rousseau. Rousseau thought that you needed to draw it out of the child as opposed to putting it in.、Mm. Um, you definitely have to put it into the child.、Uh, now, that doesn't mean that you can't then analyze it. You can't toss it around in the classroom and do a bit of paired work and and think about it. Of course, you can. Yes. That will help the child properly understand it and properly retain it. You know,、uh, it's not a question of just the caricature of knowledge teaching. Is it's just rote learning.、Mm. Children just sit there like parrots and repeat after the、mm. teacher, and that's all that's going on. That's not what's happening.、Mm. Um, not in a good classroom. And if、yeah. you come to Michaela's classrooms, you will see all sorts of energy and all sorts of thinking and understanding going on.、Uh, but that's because, in part, we give them knowledge, and we also want them to learn it so that they know it. Memory is part of what learning is. You were a teacher for quite a long time before you set up.、Uh, you've always been a teacher, haven't you?、Yep. You're from a long line of teachers, aren't you? Or at well, least my, from your, your my father, father taught at university and the other. But you know, have you always felt this way? I mean, or did you? Has it been? Or did you have? Is it were more of the kind of orthodox view of education at one time? Did you change? Yeah, well, I was. I went through teacher training. So sadly, teacher training teaches everyone how to teach the wrong way. I mean that that's yeah, yeah. I, I, that's a big statement, but it's true. Okay,、yeah. teacher training is all wrong, and so I mean when teachers come to Michaela, for instance, we teach them how to teach differently.、Mm. They they all have to go through a process of to becoming a Michaela teacher.、Um, so I was I did went through teacher training like everybody else, and、um, of course I did loads of games. In fact, in those days,、uh, so we're looking at early twenty、uh, first century. You know, in those days. Uh, there was no talk of knowledge versus skills. I mean, that that conversation didn't exist.、No. Um, you, all you ever did, it was just considered normal that you taught skills and that you, you wanted children to get up out of their chairs in the classroom and move around, and you wanted to do brain gym and and and, whack, and flap your arms around, and you learning styles and all of this stuff was just standard in teaching.、Yeah. Since 2010, what is great is that there's much more of a conversation around what works and what doesn't work.、Right. We're now looking at brain science. We're now looking at research. We're now saying. Hey, look! You know what? This doesn't work. Now, for me, it's always been about the children in front of you,、mm. and so I learned quickly that that stuff just didn't work. I think I taught French, so I used to just think, well, maybe it works for other subjects. It just doesn't work for French <laughs> because that was what I taught, you know. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I thought,、yeah. well, it just doesn't work for languages. It's just different,、yeah. and so. I did my verb. I, we did verb tables, and we did the kind of more old-fashioned stuff. And guess what? My kids did really well, right?、Uh, Michaela, the woman who we named the school after, she's originally from Saint Lucia. Sadly,、right. she died of cancer in 2011. She was exactly like that. Very old-fashioned.、Uh, she used to talk about rigor. She said, "Where is the rigor, Catherine?" You know, and、yeah. um, she was all about discipline, all about the kids.、Um, Just working hard and traditional teaching, and she would stand in front of the classroom despite all the fads and despite being told to do differently,、yeah. which is why we named the school after her. Would you think, actually? I mean, from what you're saying there, 
I've got a business plan for you. Um, mm -hmm. You're doing this new school in Stevenage, right? Yes. That will be a few years, Wendy, because you've got to get the school together and everything, haven't you? Mm -hmm. But what about a, a Michaela teacher training school? Yeah, well... Um, Isn't that the very root of what you're talking about? Yes, but I need to get a lot of teachers thinking that way in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, um, we're a really small institution, so, you know, you can train people up, but then, I mean, you're talking about a much bigger thing. Yeah. Eventually, yes, yeah, possibly. Yeah. Um, you know, there are some places, Buckingham University, that do things slightly mm -hmm. differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't want to say all teacher training, but the vast majority of it is, 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 is just is, is, has fallen to this progressive way of, of thinking. And um, what makes me really sad is that th there are people who I know personally who have dedicated their lives to teaching, hardworking individuals who care about the kids. Mm. But because all of the philosophy is wrong around it, mm. the kids aren't, aren't benefiting. Mm. And um, people don't understand that holding kids to account and holding your standards high is, is to be on the kid's side. Mm. It, I don't get to school at 6.30 every morning because I hate kids, right? Because mm, mm. I love them. I haven't been fighting the establishment all this time yeah. because, I, because I hate kids, because I love them. Yeah. And I want the establishment to do what's right by them. Sadly, often the state gets it wrong. Mm. You know, I'm very anti-big state. I'm, mm, I'm, I'm really into the small mm, state. Mm. And why, even though I work for the state, it's because I have worked for the state all my life. Yeah, and yeah. I have seen the yeah. damage it causes. And just it just gets everything wrong. Um, and so, you know, I'm not saying it shouldn't exist. Obviously, it needs to exist. We depend on the state, but um, we do need to re reduce its influence. And uh, that's why I love free schools, yeah. because they're still state schools, but yeah. it gives an ownership to the yeah. people who are, who, are, who are running the school. Yeah. Um, and they're able to think outside the box. Uh, one of the problems with the state is that people working for the state tend to just keep doing the same thing over and over again. Mm. And they don't question. When you're running a small business, um, you, you, the bottom line matters, right? And if something isn't selling, you need to be thinking, right, well, I'm going to put that on sale and then I'm going to sell it like this. I'm going to do this. And there's a dance that you do every day, a capitalist dance yeah, that you do. Yeah. Uh, when you're working in the state, there is no capitalist dance that happens. And you could just clock in, clock out every day and you'd still earn your salary and nothing much changes. Now, I'm not saying teachers want to do that, uh, but it can happen. You just kind of end up somebody who's just kind of clocking in, clocking out. The thing about free schools is that it just puts a bit more energy back into yes, the system, yeah, right? Yeah. People then own it, you know? Uh, and I suppose the same is to be said of academy chains. You know, that's mm. the idea behind it. Mm. Now, there are all sorts of problems that come with academy chains. I'm not mm. uh, without my criticisms for academy chains. But um, the good thing about them is that there's some sense of accountability, right? Mm. That, that's the thing. It's mm. accountability. Mm. And kids need to be held to account. Teachers need to be held to account. Head teachers need to be held to account. Um, and there's too little of it in the system. What, I mean, what... Going from before you set up, Michaela, uh, right through to now, you, you when you talk about the state, you talk about the educational establishment as well, the state one, you must have had, you know, a fair amount of aggro from them. And mm -hmm. I, I wonder how you've handled that, how do you deal with that? I mean, because if you're going, if you're swimming against contrarian, if you're swimming yeah. against the tide, it's lonely, isn't it? Yeah. Very, very lonely. It is. And I am hated by a lot of people. But I remember those children. I just remember mm. the children, the thousands of children that I have known in my lifetime. And I remember the children that I have now in my hands. And I remember the fact that, you know, life is only worth living if you're doing something where you're making a difference. And I always say that I don't imagine that the big changes in education will come in my lifetime. You know, people who fought against slavery, people who wanted the vote for women and the Berlin Wall finally came down. You know, you, you, you work for something in your life yeah. and at the end of your life, you, you pass the baton on. And that's my plan yeah. is that I will pass the baton on and I hope to have achieved something in my small lifetime, you know, because what else is the point of, of living, you know? Um, I have this great quote by Thomas Sowell and my, who's a, a great African-American Oh, I know indeed, yeah. I'd uh, love to get writer. him on this program. Yeah, mm. I mean, it will be a sad day when he goes. I say that because he's 85 or something, you know? Right. And um, I love him. Anyway, he, he has this quote where he says, uh, if you want to help yourself, yeah. you tell people what they want to hear. If you want to help uh, uh, others, you, you, you tell them the truth. If, yes. you, if you want to help yeah. other yeah. people, you yeah. tell them the truth. Yeah. And um, that's what I mean about being a truth teller. Yeah. You want to, you, 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 telling the truth, only the truth will set us free, yeah. right? Yeah. And there's too, too much in education where people are just, uh, they're not looking at what's real. Um, 
And the number one thing, I mean, you say about knowledge, you're absolutely right, we teach knowledge. You're absolutely right about the discipline. I also say things that distinguish us is we teach gratitude. Right. We teach children to be grateful for what they've got. And no matter how hard their lives are, and our, the, our children's lives, some of them are awful. We're in the inner city, we're surrounded by gangs. Children will turn up, at, at other children from other schools will turn up, I say children, 16 year olds on bikes, masked, carrying knives, waiting for our kids. One of our kids left uh, after his GCSE exam, a whole bunch of kids from another school rushed him, one that got stabbed with a compass. Oh. Like we are in the inner city and mm. we have got a very tough mm. intake, right? Mm. So, the, you know, life is difficult for some of our kids. Mm. However, mm. they're still better off than some of those kids who don't have enough food to eat in some African countries, right? Mm. We have all got to be grateful for what we've got mm. in life. Mm. Because if all you do is spend your time being miserable and saying life is unfair and, oh, there are all these, all these obstacles in front of me. This is my whole fight with the whole kind of race thing. You know, when yeah, people, yeah. Oh, I'm black and I'm, I'm poor and I, I grew up with a single mother, so I can't possibly make it in life. Yeah, that yeah. defeatist kind of victimhood mentality will never get you anywhere. And I'm not saying the world isn't racist. I'm not saying life isn't gonna be difficult for you. It, it may be very difficult, it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. You have got to pick yourself up and you've got to keep going. There has to be a sense of personal responsibility in here and there has to be a sense of gratitude for what you've been given in life. Our kids at our school need to be grateful because they're at a school called Michaela, right? But, but the, 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 the irony of this, of course, is these claims are made on behalf often of kids, you know, vict as you meant the victimhood thing. Yeah. Um, but in fact, amongst sort of like African parents and Asian parents, you have got the most aspirational people, haven't you, who really want their kids to do really, really well. Well, you say that. Some of them are like that. It depends on how long they've been in this country. Right. Uh, right. And I say that because I think the welfare state and welfareism generally uh, affects people and can, can affect people in a negative way if you're around it too much. Mm. Um, and, uh, and there can be too much complacency, this sense of the state is going to sort it out for yeah, you, yeah. as opposed to you taking personal responsibility, yeah, right? Yeah. And. Um, and, and, and that is something that we're constantly pushing in school, is this idea of personal responsibility for you. You got the detention, well, you did something wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Don't go and blame it on somebody else. Mm -hmm. And maybe somebody else did something, but you should be interested in what you did. Yeah. Um, and, and we also have a sense of duty, duty to others, and a sense of obligation. What are you going to do with your life? How are you going to give back, right? Um, it's our duty as teachers to properly teach these children. Right? I, was, I, I was very struck as well by you making a point about, you know, the. Britain is a kind of like a family and we're mm -hmm. going to celebrate. You, you mentioned earlier British history, but yeah. how else do you sort of instill a feeling of community and national community in your schools? I mean, how... Well, we sing. You sing. What do you sing? Uh, um, I vow to thee, my country. Oh. I was singing it this morning. Um, yeah. God save the Queen, Jerusalem. Uh, we also uh, talk about these things. You know, we do assemblies. Uh, during the World Cup, we had England flags everywhere. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. all about go England, go England. This is particularly important for ethnic minorities yeah. who can often feel, well, oh, you know, well, am I British? Well, you know, what yeah, am I really, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's so important because if you don't feel like you belong in your country, you can never succeed, okay? You have to feel that. Now, some of these kids may grow up and become revolutionaries. Well, great, I mean, that's fine. I've done my job as a teacher. It's my duty. Yes. It's my duty to help socialize yes. them. I always talk about the family of Michaela. You've got your own nuclear family. Then you've got your larger community. You've got your school family. And then we've got the larger family of the country. Yeah. And we should all feel like we are together, especially in a multicultural community. It's all the more important because that's the thing that we share together. Otherwise, we end up splitting, right? And then there's all this discord. If, if we are to get on together, we have to share something. And the one thing we share is being British. And isn't that a wonderful thing? You know, in some countries, thing. you get murdered <laughs> if you're gay. You know, the police will murder you in some countries. In some countries, yeah. you, 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 if you're a woman, you can't drive a car, whatever. You know, the point is that we live in a wonderful country. And this is something that we should be celebrating. Doesn't mean it doesn't have its problems. Yeah. I'm the number one person to say that the education system in Britain has its problems, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that doesn't mean I don't love it as my country, right? Yeah. And, um, and so should the children. And so sh we, should all sh we should all be grateful for this. But too often, we, we don't recognize that and we don't want to celebrate that. And, um, and that's, really, that's, that's really sad. Mm. Um, you know, I often joke about how it's the end of the West, and, you know, um, and, and that's because we've lost something. You know, uh, you talk about Scruton saying post-truth, yeah. you know. Um, w w a lot of people, I think, know this in their heart of hearts. They know, you know how many times, like I tweet loads and then I go to an event and I get so many people, teachers, who come up to me and whisper to me and they say, I really like what you're saying on Twitter. 
but they would never say it out loud no. because they're terrified. Yes. And this is crazy. We can't have a situation where people can't say what they, what, they, what they believe, what they think, and let's have a conversation. But that's because too many people want to shut the conversation down and they say, no, you're not allowed to speak. I have people on Twitter uh, getting angry with me because I'm having conversations with people on Twitter who I disagree with. And they say, you shouldn't speak to them. Yeah, and yeah. I say, well, what do you mean? I disagree with them, so I want to talk to them yes, exactly. and, and, and yeah. have a conversation. They're saying no. You know, there's something wrong with our, our thinking if we just want to shut certain people out of the conversation. Kevin, you, you mentioned the Twitter. I know that you do quite a lot of tweeting and everything, but one of the big changes that's happened maybe even since Michaela was founded was this intensity of social media for young people. Now, I, you recently talked about uh, the fact that parents you felt should be shamed if they give toddlers smartphones. I mean, are, they are giving toddlers smartphones, are they? Well, you see it all the time on the tube, in restaurants. Yeah. You see it, it's normal, and they don't realise. I mean, I don't blame those parents right now because they just don't know. Um, I think it's hilarious because for many, many months I've been talking about the dangers of smartphones. Yeah. Nobody's taken any notice. Suddenly I talk about shaming parents and boom, yeah. the Sun, the Times, TES, everybody's, everybody's saying, look, Catherine Bribble Singh said that parents should be shamed. Look, I'm not saying that in the tube you need to start shouting at the parent who's giving that. The point is, is that if we have enough information about the dangers of uh, phones, then people would naturally feel a sense of shame and they wouldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. In the same way yeah. as right now, you would be shocked if you saw uh, parents smoking in front of their toddler, blowing smoke in front of them. It, yeah, it would yeah. never happen. Yeah. Once upon a time, it happened all the time. Yeah. And then we found out about the dangers of smoking. And because we're all much more informed now, there's a sense of shame around smoking. And we go outside to do it. And we don't we certainly wouldn't want to do it around children. Um, it's the same thing with smartphones. Uh, if we were more informed, there would be a natural sense of shame that would develop in us. Um, and that is required. The parents now don't know. My parents, so the parents at school, I tell them about, I say, look, you give a 13-year-old boy access to porn, He's going to look at it. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, what yeah. the phone is doing. Yeah, Once upon a time, we used to porn magazines up at the top, right? Oh, yes, yeah? yes, I remember. <laughs> Nowadays, we say, here's a phone, honey. Go and look as, yeah. as much porn as you yeah. like. And not just on a magazine form, but video form, yeah. right? Um, the girls, if, if, if I looked at, if, if the parents looked at the, so, at the social media, so Snapchat, Instagram, yeah. and the pictures that the girls make, them, they make themselves look five years older, they're pouting their lips, they're sticking their bottoms out. Their only understanding of being a woman is to be some little dolly bird that looks a certain way, as opposed to being a strong woman who can go out and do something with their life, you know? Um, if parents understood, if they saw that the kind of conversations, the swearing, the bullying, the undermining, how terrible it is on yeah, there, yeah. they would never let their children on there, but they don't know, right? But I mean, but, 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 but you know, when I said toddlers earlier, I, I was thinking literally of kids, you know, really like preschool kids. Yeah, that is what I meant. And they are, oh, I see. Do right, you not okay. see them? There all the time. You see them in the trains yeah, and yeah, so on. Yeah. You see parents giving their child a phone. What I mean is the phone is, there are prams that yeah. you can buy now. There are buggies that have a slot to put the iPad oh. and the phone in so you can turn it and face it to the baby to entertain the child, oh, okay? Jesus. Like, that is where we're at. Yeah, yeah, and my point is yeah. those companies, if it was the case that we had the information on how damaging this is for children, yeah. then they just wouldn't exist, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, parents are handing them because it's an easy babysitter. You know, here's the phone, I'm gonna talk, I'm in a restaurant, I'm gonna give them a phone to the child, yeah. I'm gonna get on. Now, there are some great apps you can play chess. You can learn maths. There are all sorts of things that you can do on a smartphone if you're with your parent and you're doing it together yeah. and you're watching what they're up to. Because actually, with many of these maths games and so on, they can just guess mm. <laughs> and then they win the mm. prize. Mm. You have to be watching to make sure and you have to choose the app carefully, mm. right? Uh, parents don't know. They don't mm. realize that a book cannot compete with a phone. It mm. just can't. Mm. And so, you know, the phone has colors and flashes and changes and so on. A book is flat. Mm. Now, if you want your child to be able to read, your listeners, listen to me, do not give your child a phone. Uh, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, all yeah. of the big tech CEOs, Did they do not give their children phones. When Steve Jobs was asked in 2010 what his children thought of the iPad, he said, my children don't have the iPad. Why would I give them the iPad? This is extraordinary right? though, Catherine, isn't it? I mean, you, I've, heard, I've heard exactly the same. They're very clear about it. They won't let their own children 
because mm-hmm. they protect their own children while they're making exactly. billions yes, out exactly. of us and our ignorance, yeah, right? Exactly. They're pumping millions into their advertising. Yeah. And WhatsApp, Snapchat, and so on, they hire teams of addiction people. They're, they're addiction teens to make it so that the thing is so addictive that the child can't put it down, right? These people are flying around in private jets, and we, stupid us, are going off buying these things. And then I get people on Twitter who say, oh, but my, I'm fine, actually, because I monitor my children, and yeah. so if everybody should just monitor their children, it's just bad parenting. Look, when you are a parent who's working two or three jobs and you're not home in the evening, there is nothing you can do, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it is unfair for the rich to be oppressing the poor. This is what's going on. I'm telling you those smartphones are exacerbating the divide between rich and poor. And in 25 years, people are going to be writing reports and PhDs on this about how the poor have got even poorer and the divide has done that because of those smartphones. Uh, And they all have the most expensive smartphones. So we have this idea that the poor are too poor to buy smartphones. They're buying them and they're buying more than one. And the children are glued to them. And look, a smartphone, you have a 20 second thing on Snapchat, Oh, look, look at that man with the bald head. <laughs> and then that's, all, that, that's the little ditty that they watch for right. 20 seconds. Yeah, yeah. A book has a narrative arc that does that. Mm. You, you learn, to, you get to know the characters. There is depth in a book. There is no depth in Snapchat and Instagram. And the children get used to no concentration span, bam, bam, bam. When they then have to do this with a book, it's just too much. It's too difficult. Apparently, there was a, I read in the, uh, the Times a while ago, there was a survey done of 600 head teachers, I think, and they were talking about the anxiety levels now and amongst their pupils. Yeah, exactly. Right. Brought on a hell of a lot of it by social media, addiction Absolutely. to social media. So apparently now there are things like kids getting, um, uh, or rather parents sending in letters saying, can such and such be excused from learning languages because it's too stressful? Yeah. It, the stress blaming, level has gone up. They're blaming the academic subjects. That's absolutely yeah, ridiculous. Yeah. Take the smartphone away. And I have parents who've done that, right? Parents who have listened to me. They take the smartphone away from their child. And at first, all hell breaks loose. You have children right. going on hunger strikes and all sorts of craziness. They refuse to come into school because they're so addicted to the phone, right? It's like taking heroin away from a heroin addict. That's what it's like, right? Now, people will say, oh, that's an exaggeration. I'm telling you, I've seen it, right? Yeah, yeah. They, are, they are threatening to kill themselves because they don't have their phone. Then they get over it, right? Yeah, yeah. They get over it, few weeks of hell. And I always tell the parents, just dig deep, just hold the line, yeah. okay? <laughs> and the ones who listen to me and they yeah, hold the line, yeah. They say to me, I, I film the parents and then I show the other parents to try and persuade them. The parents say, I've got my boy back. His personality had changed. He was depressed. He was anxious. I've got my girl back. She was so terrified all the time, being bullied and awful. And she was so unhappy. And now I've got my child back. The lovely, innocent child that they once were is now back. What is, it, uh, what is your policy then, uh, Michaela? What is, what, no phones in the classroom, what? Yes, but that's just, look. That, yes, that's obviously, just, that's just a, obviously you shouldn't have phones at school. Yeah. If we see them or here, we need to take them. And so we never see them, we never hear them because the children don't take them but out. But presumably in a lot of state schools, that there's, going to be a, there's going to be a you're teacher right. standing there and the kids are going to openly that's be right. on their phones. So that's terrible. And that's awful. And, and you're right. But that for me is an, an obvious basic. You shouldn't have phones in the yeah. school. I'm, talk, I'm going beyond that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm saying I don't want them at home either. Um, I'm saying that if children are trying to revise for the GCSEs and they can't because they are addicted to the phone. And people don't necessarily realize how, how awful this is. And other schools might not realize it because they've got so many daily problems going on. At Michaela, things are so smooth sailing. Yeah. You know, there's great teaching going on. The children are behaving. Everything's lovely. I have been able to isolate this as my main problem. You want to ask me what my biggest challenge is? Yep. Smartphones. That's my biggest challenge and not in the school because we don't have that as a problem. The biggest fo- sp- problem I have is getting kids to do their work at home because they won't work because they are so addicted to their phones. Yeah. They say it to me themselves. They say, miss, I want to, I want to. What can I do? Please help me. We have a whole digital detox system at school where they can actually drop their phones off to us for a night or two and then it gives their brains a break. There's all sorts of studies done on this about how it actually breaks the brain. What I mean by that is your memory chain gets broken. You are no longer able to concentrate trade. I, children, look, I, your 11's mine, who, who gave in their phones, they gave in their phones in September, some of them, so they had a whole run up without their phones, right, mm, and the video mm, games, mm, they gave in the, mm. the cables. They have said to me, they felt their brains 
get get smarter. Yeah, yeah right. They yeah. actually felt it. Now I don't have the data. I can't, I don't have the proof in black and white, mm. but I've got the stories from the children, and I tell you, I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And I wish people would listen to me. And I keep shouting about it, and then all people say is, "Oh, you want your parents shamed." Oh, for goodness sakes, yeah, listen yeah. to the content of what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. I'm saying that if we knew more about this, an, a natural sense of shame would develop in all of us and we simply wouldn't do it. And unfortunately, because it's a new technology, right? It's new, mm -hmm. so we don't know. It's only in the last few years that it's become so common to have a smartphone like this. Um, and those guys in California, they know what they're doing, right? Oh, absolutely. They know, they yeah, yeah. and we are all idiots. But and we need to, uh, you know, if I have to talk about shame, I'll talk about it. If it means that people are going to start listening to me, then I'll talk about it all they like. Do you know, I think one of the most uh, sad things, actually, you know, this is like just really old man talk here, but, you know, maybe in the 70s, there's a new album out, the new David Bowie album. People would go and they would queue for it. Yes. And they'd go home and, they'd, and it would be, you know, have an amazing picture on it, the word. Now they queue for technology. They yes. queue for the new phone yes. you know and you sort of think ah, it's something so sterile about this you know, know okay it's all the stuff they can do and all the rest of it but have you changed your own social smartphone usage do you think no well you know it's interesting i i really don't like twitter and for the first couple of years uh at the school i wasn't on twitter at all i didn't like it and then i was on twitter i never went on it the problem is is that if i'm not speaking on social media to tell people what we're about that vacuum gets filled by somebody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then people start saying things about us and start characterizing us in ways that are not correct. Yeah. So I've realized that actually for my job, it is really important that I'm out there in social media yeah. explaining what we're about and saying what, what I think. Yeah. Because otherwise, people then attribute all sorts of ideas to me. They still do, but they do it less yeah. because I've, I've filled that vacuum and I, I, and I have a voice now more so on Twitter. So that's why I do it. But I mean, you know, I have a Facebook account. I never go on it. Um, I'm certainly not on Snapchat or Instagram. I can't stand any of that stuff. I mean, I, I hate all of that stuff, frankly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you wouldn't believe it given that I'm I regularly tweet, but I'm tweeting for the movement, right? I, 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 I'm, yeah. I, I'm fighting the establishment. Yeah. And in order to fight it, I, I'm doing it partly on Twitter. I think um, when it comes to Instagram and, and, and particularly Instagram, there are people on it who appear to be able to make this extraordinary living with 200,000 yes. followers, or whatever, sort of like on thin air almost, or just this product. Yes. And you can see that apparently, you know, a lot of kids will ask what you want to be when you when you grow up and the idea yes. of even wanting to be an astronaut okay that's old old stuff yes. oh i want to be a celebrity or maybe even an instagram star or yes. what you know wherever it is that that is kind of worrying isn't it really yeah well a lot of them say that i mean we do quite a good job michaela to, yeah. to stop them from thinking in that yeah. way and to think in a, in a more traditional fashion um yeah and, and some of it can be quite dangerous i mean we, we we've had a couple of kids who've posted well, videos that, that can, can involve gangs yeah. you know there was a boy around the corner from our school not from our school but he he posted um something on on uh youtube uh, uh that insulted a south london gang and they came up and they killed him you know and uh and so we've had those kinds of issues where some of our kids get involved in that and we're trying to say to them and to their parents your child's life is at risk here yeah. you know that's the other thing about a smartphone you give a child a smartphone Everybody out there has access to your child. They know where they live. Mm. They know what school they go to. Mm. They know who their friends are. They know what they like to do. You know, and children are vulnerable. Their brains are still growing. So that's what I mean about breaking the brain. Yeah. And also, they're not, they're, they're naive. They can easily get sucked in. And I mean, I could tell you stories of children who have been murdered, right? And people, you know, people think I'm exaggerating. I am not exaggerating about the dangers. And in particular, even if you don't want to worry about their safety, just the business of wanting yeah, to do well yeah. at GCSE, wanting yeah. to, 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 to be able to read. Yeah. And the younger ones, we haven't seen it yet, right? Those two-year-olds who are on smartphones from now, they haven't come through the system yet. Oh, God, we no, have, no, we, no. We just wait and see, yeah. right? Well, you will be there for them, I will, the other end. And I will keep on fighting. <laughs> Councillor, thank you so much for coming in. It's just, just wonderful and, and, you know, all power to you. you know, thank for, you. And for, also for the new for, uh, school when it comes up in uh, Stevenage. Thank you. Thank you very so. much. Thank you. Thanks very much um, for watching. So what you're saying is, see you next time.